Um, okay. Uh, so, um, hello. Um, my name is Julian Friedman. Um, I work for IBM on the Garden Project. Um, I'm super excited to be here. This is this is really exciting. It's awesome to see so many familiar faces. I work out of the UK most of the time, so um, it's always nice to see people who I normally just see on video screens. Um, I'm going to talk a bit today about um, Garden, um, uh, which is um, Cloud Foundry's container technology. Um, anyone who was at Onzi's talk, which was awesome, um, will already know a bit about containerization, why we use containerization, what it is, what Diego's looking to get out of it. So I'm not going to talk too much about that, and I'm just going to apologize if um, there's some missing context about containers. Um, today, I'm going to try and answer three questions. So question one, what are containers? What are we trying to achieve by containerization? Question two, um, what is Garden? What is Docker? Um, what are the differences, and why do we use Garden rather than Docker? Um, and then question three, can we use Docker instead of Garden? Um, and the spoiler is yes. I'm going to demo doing that. Um, we have a back end for Garden called Docker. I'm going to show that working. Um, and then I'm going to ruin the uh, one more thing. The one more thing is, should we replace um, Docker with Garden with Docker? Um, and that's a much harder question. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of my view, but mostly I'm just going to give you ammunition for the discussion that I think is there. I'm going to give some facts about that. Um, so containers. Um, has anyone heard of containers? Has, have they come up at all, containers? <laughs> um, yeah, so containers um, are pretty cool. Um, containers. Um, have got a lot of attention, right? Um, but what actually are they? Well, the more interesting question isn't what are they, it's what are we using them for, right? What are containers for, right? I think there's about four things. Um, first one is, is this idea of packaging, right? That's, what's, that's the Docker use case, right? That's this, this idea that we can have reproducible images that we're going to ship over. Same image works here as works here, um, and so on. The second one is reproducibility. It's placed into packaging. Um, I'm going to run my thing locally. I'm going to run it remotely. It's going to work in the same way. I'm going to know how that occurs. Um, thirdly, super important, isolation security. If I'm running lots of containers um, on a particular machine, I want to make sure that that's secure, that each one is isolated so I can run lots of applications so they don't interfere with each other. And there's loads more in Onzi's talk. Um, if you, I'm sure that will be available on the interwebs. Um, and the fourth one is cheapability, cheapness, something, right? Um, we can run loads, we get de the density of them, right? The other thing we're trying to achieve in density. Um, and the thing to notice is some of these bits are more important for some people than other bits, right? Um, so from the, for, the, for the Docker use case, what's really important is this awesome packaging workflow, this reproducibility workflow. Um, that's the developer experience. That's me on my laptop, right? That's what I care about. If you're building a PaaS, uh, that's a multi-tenant platform environment, what I really care about is I can do this in a secure way so that I can run the images and be confident that I can run them in production, scale them, not have people getting other people's data and so on, um, and do that at a good cost, right? Um, and, and inevitably, there will always be trade-offs when you're building systems, right? Um, and the question is, um, how do you make these trade-offs, right? So, Garden is very much um, built to try and emphasize the later things. But it turns out that we can actually enable the Docker use cases as well. So there's some obvious follow-on questions, right? Um, how hard is creating a container, right? What are we actually talking about here? Um, well, it turns out not actually that hard, right, for, for certain values of hard, right? Um, it's actually most of the stuff is there in the kernel. Um, the kernel gives you, as Onzi said, isolation. The kernel gives you namespacing. Um, so a lot of what a container technology really does is provide an API to actually use those in a consumable way. Right? So the kernel gives you the primitives. And most of what Docker or Garden um, or Rocket or any of the other things are doing 
is providing a way of using those capabilities. So the garden way of doing that is um, to provide a programming API for those capabilities. Because really, Garden's use case is to power platforms as a service and things like that. So we have an API-driven approach. Garden doesn't have a CLI, for example. Garden has an internal API, but that's not what we treat as our external interface. We treat our external interface as the rich client. Right? Um, the bigger question is how much work is creating a production-ready container, right? um, something that we can actually trust to run our applications. So using these things together, that's easy. But finding the right, um, the f finding ways to run that securely so you trust it and scalably, that's pretty hard, right? Um, and even more, finding the right abstractions, how you expose this to users in a way that makes sense, which is actually really Diego's problem, not Gardner's problem. That is super hard, right? Um, th those are the actual challenges. The, the bit around how you actually run a container um, is not that much stuff. So. Um, I feel like I kind of have to put in a history lesson, um, even though it doesn't really matter, right? Um, I'm now going to go, we were there first, basically, right? Um, um, Warden actually predates the other two. So the obvious question is, why did you build Warden, right, when Docker was out there? The answer is Docker wasn't out there, so we built Warden, right? And then later Docker came out. Um, we've now rewritten Warden. Um, we've written a lot of the components in Go, so that's why it's called Garden, but it's actually mostly the same code base um, underneath. Um, and really, it's, it, it isn't really that important, right, that you know, this is where we are now. But um, it is worth saying, and you might have heard of Docker, um, it is worth saying, right, that there is a difference in the use case between these two, right? So if we compare Docker versus Garden, the original use case of these, of these two, um, Garden was always built to run lots of containers in production in a multi-tenant environment, right? Um, and actually, when it was first built, its main use case was running one rootFS, right? So each container is basically going to run the same rootFS with lots of applications on top. Whereas Docker's use case um, is, was originally less about the multi-tenant environment, I think it's fair to say but also about each container might have a completely different root FS, the managing of layering and images and so forth. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a pretty big difference, right, between when you're trying to run a single container on a laptop, which is a hard problem, um, versus like loads of containers and trying to orchestrate those and run those on a big system, right? Um, but you have to notice, right, these use cases are coming together, right? It's pretty clear um, that Lattice is very interested in providing a single machine developer experience now and can really do that. And Docker is increasingly interested in how we build big systems. So these two things are coming together. So give me a high level view of Garden, right? Um, like what, what, what does Garden look like? What's, what's the Garden abstraction? Um, so number one, Garden um, is a VM model, right? So Garden containers look like VMs. Um, inside a garden container, it seems like you're running a little VM. And that's actually super useful because we have projects like Bosch Lite, which people might have used, which enables you to simulate running a whole Cloud Foundry environment on a virtual machine. And that uses Warden containers underneath to spin up what look like lots of virtual machines that look like a production system, right? Um, it's also used for the build pack applications. So for build pack applications, we want to be able to throw in that um, compiled build pack into a container, run it, run health checks inside it and so on, um, and make them appear like a VM, right? Um, so to do that, in Garden, we have an init process, so we run PID1, right? So in a Docker container, the user's application is the only application normally in the container, and it is the first PID. Um, in, in Garden, we have the first PID, and it spawns all the other applications. Um, and that can be used to reap child processes and so on, so that it looks like a real environment. Um, and, and Garden is built to run a path, right? It's also uh, multi-platform. So Garden is an abstraction that you can build multiple backends for, right? So we have a Garden Linux backend, which I work on. There's also a Garden Windows backend. Um, and the, the reason that works is because it's quite a well-chosen abstraction. It's quite a high-level abstraction. Um, and it runs, it was built to run build pack applications, but it also runs Docker images. So we actually support Docker images. We use Docker's code to pull the images down and then just run them inside a garden container. So it's kind of the best of all worlds. 
give me a high-level view of Docker. Um, has anyone heard of Docker? Um, so Docker, obviously an app-based model, right? Um, which doesn't stop you running multiple processes within it, but its main model is an app-based model. Um, one app per container. Um, and in general, the containers package the root file system of the application. So a Docker image doesn't separate, here's the image, and now run this in it. The metadata includes what should I run it, who should I run it as, what's its home directory, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's quite a um, tightly coupled thing, which is really great for a user, right? I've got like, my thing, and I know how to run it. It runs the same everywhere. But it is quite tightly coupled. Um, and it yeah, uses a layer file, layer file system to make it efficient to run whatever root fest you give us, right? And because that's a big use case, um, which is really great for local development. Um, so I would, it, that's really great for local development. But obviously, if you manage that in a PaaS, it's actually pretty difficult, right? Because with a, if, if you think about build pack applications, but they're all going to share the same root FS, which we can cache, right? Uh, so we use layer, layered file systems to cache it. And then each build pack is just a little bit on top, right? Whereas in the Docker case, all it takes is for someone to push, instead of pushing something based on Ubuntu, they push something based on Red Hat or anything else. And we have to pull down the bits for that file system because we don't have the base layer, right? the shared base layer. Um, someone can keep doing that. And now we've got lots of disk space being used and having to manage all those layers, having to patch all that stuff. Right? It's a much harder problem for a multi-tenant environment. Um, so, oops. So what's so great about Garden? Well, um, it's got a really great abstraction, right? So because, because we've got quite a high-level, simple abstraction, you can plug in multiple backends. Therefore, we've got a Windows backend. Um, therefore, we're able to do this experimentation. Secondly, it's got a Go client. Um, the Go client is the first-class citizen. It's built for building containers with, right? Um, if, you're run, if you're building a container, what you want is to be able to have a bit of Go code that says, create me this, run this, right? Um, especially if your platform's built on Go. Um, Freedom to experiment because we can put in these multiple back, back ends um, and pluggable back ends, right? I've said pluggable back ends a lot of times. Why do I keep saying pluggable back ends? Well, we already have Linux and Windows. And if we're talking about experimentation, then you could actually run a few other ones, right? Um, for example, obviously, Docker, right? So we've got a great abstraction, it's got a Golang client. And it's pluggable. Maybe we could take advantage of both of these. But I'll quickly talk about what's not so great, to be fair, right? Um, there's some technical debt. Um, Garden, Garden is a, was one of the early container technologies, and it's done good service. But there's, some, there's a good deal of technical debt in the code, which we're having to fix. Um, one of the big problems is it really wasn't built for this use case. So it was not built considering how do you securely run untrusted images, which is the use case that's now much more prevalent with Dockerized, containerized applications, right? Um, so that's a new use case for us, and securing that is pretty difficult, right? In the old world, we just ran you as the VCAP user, and we never let you have root. And now people want to run their root FS, right? So their Linux image, um, which we can't secure and we can't see first, as root on our machines. That's a super hard problem, and it's a big change, right? So we're having to figure out how to change Garden to do that. Um, oops. Gotta love clickers. Yeah, it also has a much smaller community around it. Like, we just have to be honest about this, right? Um, Garden's great, but it's a pretty small community of users versus Docker. Etc. Right, and that has some big effects. Right, it means, for example, um, that we support a couple of layered file system drivers, whereas Docker supports a huge number of layered file system drivers, um, operating systems, etc. Um, and yeah, it's less well known. So, what's so great about Docker? Um, well, it is an amazing user experience. It's great to package your applications up. Um, there's this huge benefit of you know, everyone uses this, right? Docker doesn't have really a standard, right? Standardization is the wrong word, but it's great that everyone's running the same sorts of images and knows what to expect. Um, it has this huge community around it, and it's pretty robust, full-featured, um, and very, very well-known, right? There's a, there's a name value to it. Um, what's not so great? Well, for us, um, it's, 
Um, I, I don't say this is a knock against Docker, right? The, the tight coupling is great from a user experience point of view. Um, but if you want to build a PaaS on top of it, what you really want is to be able to say to it, use this rootfs, run this in it. Um, and actually, with Docker, I there's, tend to say, run this rootfs, and then it will figure out what that rootfs wants run in it and how. And that's quite different from what you want um, to build something on top of, right? Um, because it's not like a, it's an opinionated abstraction. And you really want a non-opinionated abstraction when you're building things on top of it and you want to have the freedom to experiment and change things around. Um, the API is the standard, right? Um, that, that is a problem it, when you want to, for example, run the same thing on Windows, experiment with different things. When there isn't a standard that you can expect, that's still a problem for us. Um, and it has a one app per container model, which is great when you're trying to run Docker apps when you're trying to run, for example, Bosch Lite, which wants to represent real machines and be used for like, that broader use case, that's a lot more difficult. Um, so that brings us to part two, building a Docker backend for Garden. So how do we combine the advantages of Garden with the huge community and familiarity of Docker? Well, we write a Docker backend for Garden. So, pluggable backends, let's write a Docker backend for Garden. Why? Well, because we can, right? Reason one. Because um, uh, we want to know what the gaps really are, right? Um, so, actually, Garden does most of what we need, right? There's, it's working great right now, but there is a huge community around Docker. There's lots of available resources for it. Um, if we can take advantage of that, um, that would be awesome, right? That would be great to not rebuild the, the wheel, right? Um, and we'd have three goals, right? Um, we want to maintain the freedom of choice of backend container technologies, right? So one of the great things about Garden is we can swap in multiple backends. We can have a Windows backend. We'd like to be able to have Rocket, App Container, et cetera. Um, if that later becomes available, if that becomes the right choice, it's great to keep that open, right? Um, well, we can do that, right? This is just a toggle backend for Garden. If we write it as a backend for Garden, we're not getting rid of the Garden API. We can do that. Secondly, we want to be able to take advantage of the ecosystem around Docker. Well, if we run it as a backend for Garden, we get all the advantages of the Docker code in the backend. So that'd be awesome. Um, and finally, we want to make sure it works in a multi tenant PaaS environment. This is harder, right? This we don't get for free by writing it as a backend, but we get the same APIs. Um, and we probably have to build some stuff on top of Docker. So we'll probably have to run our own stuff to add the additional things to multi-tenancy. But those are things that we should push and get back into the community where we find those gaps. Right? That's what working in an open source community means. Um, so this is possible. Right? So how, how, how is it going to work? Right? Well, um, basically, um, we're going to start our own daemon as process one. Right? We need to do that because we want to have this, this VM-like model. Right? And we don't want the user to be able to run as application one. And we want our own thing if we want to support that model. So we're just going to run our own one. And we'll tell Docker that the application it should run is not the user's application, it's our container daemon. And it, that runs as the init process. Um, we're actually, in the, in, in, the, in, in the back end, it's just going to shell out directly to Docker because it's fast. So we just run the Docker executable to run things. It has a couple of problems, um, which I'll talk about, but it gets it working pretty quickly. Um, and then we actually just reuse lots of Garden Linux libraries. So Garden Linux has libraries for doing things like setting up the networking, the way that we like the networking set up, um, and, and for spawning off processes so that we can reattach them later and doing all these things. Um, and actually, all the primitives at the bottom are pretty much the same, right? All kernel resources. So we just reuse those modules um, around the Docker container. So we get the Docker container to create the container with our process in it, and then use our existing code to actually spawn stuff into it. Um, and it's actually surprisingly easy. Like this, this didn't take very long to get working, which um, is because Garden's actually a pretty simple API, which tells you a lot about the advantages of Garden. Right? Um, here's some pictures. Um, this is how you spawn a Garden container. This is what happens in Garden, right? So a Garden container, we have something called WushD, which creates a container, and it actually clones a copy of itself into the container, which runs as the first process. Um, that uh, process keeps a little socket on the outside world. So it's got a socket in the outside world, which is not in the container. It spawns stuff into its container. We've still got a socket outside, and we ask it to do stuff. And that's how Garden, uh, Garden works today. Um, when you actually want to run a process, you've got a little thing called Wush, which is the warden shell. And it says, hey, Wush, 
uh, tell WushD to start a container right, over this socket. Um, and then Wush starts the container, so that's the process inside the container, and it forwards the input back. So then these two are connected. So you then got the inputs and output, standard input error just gets connected between them, right? So it looks like that, right? So that's how Garland containers work. We are now going to uh, Dockerize it, prepare to Dockerize, boom, right? And this is all that you have to do. So number one, change the name. Number two, yeah, that's now called initd, right? Got rid of the thing. Uh, number three, we use a Docker daemon to spawn it instead of cloning it in, right? But same code, just run it inside it. Um, rename those to dosh, because it's not worth doing if you can't have a funny name for at least one component. Um, and that's basically it, right? So the dosh talks to the init D over the socket um, outside, runs the processes, great. So let's have a quick demo. Um, I was going to do this demo live, but then I chickened out. Uh, my Wi-Fi didn't work this morning, and I was like, nah, this isn't, this isn't a good plan. But if anyone would like to see this demo live on my laptop later with the code, then buy me a coffee. Do that. So this is, um, this is Lattice. Um, people have not seen Lattice yet. You've got to check it out. It's amazing. It's basically a Diego deployment in a vagrant virtual machine just running. Um, and what I've done is I've changed the, uh, the Lattice deploy script so that instead of installing Garden Linux, it installs Garden Docker, right? So th but this is installed a Vagrant upt, um, and it's now running a Docker daemon inside Vagrant with Garden Docker, the Garden Docker backend rather than Garden Linux backend. Um, and I'm gonna target it. So I target the, um, so this is my Lattice CLI, right? And, um, I think for a while, okay, and then, so we now like look at the logs, right? So now all the components are coming up, right? So this takes a little while when you first start Lattice. So all the components have to find each other and start talking to each other. Um, so that takes a little bit of time, but eventually they'll come up and then we're just gonna create an application, right? So we're gonna create, and it's gonna create itself from a Docker image, right? Now normally um, in Garden Linux, what happens is we use a Docker code to pull down the Docker image and then we start it up in a Garden container. Uh, but now, and great, it's up, but now what we're going to do is use Docker to do the whole thing. So we're going to say to Docker, just run this, and it's going to download the root file system and get it up and running. So we say create, it thinks, creating the container. Now, this is the first time it's a fresh VM, so there's no cache. So it's going to take a little bit of time to get the container. So it's now pulling down the bits from Docker Hub uh, for the Docker rootFS. Um, it takes around to the second T, so the T in container, until it pulls down for the first time. But really, all that's happening now is we're pulling this down over the interweb. And, should say boom in a second. And, yeah, there. So, health check passed. So, we spawn our health check executable into it, exited, and it is running. We take the URL and we forwarded the port, so it's got the proper networking, proper port forwarding, um, and great lattice. Uh, and just to prove that um, this is actually really fast when you notice to download bits from Docker Hub, uh, we'll just do it again. And boom, great, We've got a second container, right? Super, super fast, and actually all going through Docker, right? Um, so, great. Yeah, proof. Um, so let's SSH in. And uh, what we should see is if we SSH in, firstly, if we list the process, what we'll see is a Docker daemon is now running. Right, so you can actually see what this looks like. Scroll up a bit, we'll see Docker daemon up here. Yep. And then you see our garden Docker backend. And these processes are called init Ds. These are actually the init processes in the containers that this has spawned, right? Um, but the really interesting thing is, um, so firstly, we create little directories for each container on the file system. Um, so we're going to just CD to one of those directories. Um, and the way the DOSH CLI works is it looks at what directory it's in to know what container to go to by default. Um, and then you tell it what to spawn inside the container. So we're going to say DOSH uh, PS. Um, oh, sorry, I should say Docker PS. And you can see the containers are listed in Docker, right? So they're managed by Garden, created by Garden, but they appear just perfectly normally in the Docker PS list just like every other container. 
We go in here and I say dosh psaf, right? Um, and we've spawned ps into the container with dosh, right? Which is the Docker shell for garden. But I can also just use Docker exec and spawn a process. So I can use all my existing Docker tooling. Um, and that, yeah, that works great as well. So that is garden Docker. Now, um, so, what doesn't work? Um, user namespacing doesn't work. Um, user namespacing is one of the ways that we can run uh, multi-tenant applications properly. Um, uh, unfortunately, Docker doesn't support this yet. Right? This is one of the examples of where this is a feature that Garden has prioritized because we need to run these in multi-tenant environments. We don't have that feature in Docker yet, um, which is kind of a biggie. Right? That's actually kind of a problem, um, to be honest. Um, snapshot restore, again, one of the great architectural features of Garden uh, is that if Garden needs to be updated or if it, the process goes down, um, that's fine. All the containers keep running and we reattach to them. That doesn't work, unfortunately, with Docker. You've got this long running Docker daemon, which is a problem, um, et cetera, right? There, there, are, there are problems, right? So, part three, because um, I'm running low on time, was this a good idea, right? Well, it was fun. Right? So, there was that. It does work, right? This actually works really nicely. Um, and you get to use all your Docker tools, runs with Docker PS, et cetera. Um, so maybe, right? Um, we have added this whole extra layer, right? We've got this whole extra layer of complexity now. We've got to manage Docker, manage a Docker daemon, and do all that stuff. And actually, the user experience, if you saw when I did the lattice push, is kind of identical, right? And these primitives are actually, the kernel primitives are pretty much the same in either case. Um, so, yeah. Um, but it's nice to know that we could do it now, right? We, couldn't, we didn't think we could do it a few months ago, and now we're pretty sure we can do it. So um, it is all about the use case, right? Containers are really great, but it's all about what we present to the user. The actual kernel primitives to isolate stuff are pretty similar between all these things. Um, and, and some of these you know, build packs have a lot of advantages for a pass, right? So we do want to support both of these use cases. We don't want to lock into one use case or another. Um, and we want to keep this pluggability, right? We want to keep me out to experiment with all these different container technologies. Um, Garden was why it was so easy to pull in a Garden Docker backend. That's an awesome feature. Um, and and even, what, even with leveraging the Docker technology, or or anything else, we still need this Garden component because there's still all these things that we build around the outside to actually manage the containers and provide this abstraction. Um, so I, I reckon I have about one minute for a Q&A, maybe two. I have about two potential questions. Um, before I have to call it. Um, so the question was, this was useful and fun um, and worth doing. Thank you. Um, will this actually become like a full thing that the product will do? Um, I don't know. Right? I think this is a, an open um, discussion as to where this will go. Right? At the moment, Garden and its works. It has some features like user mapping, user namespaces that we actually really need in production. Um, snapshot restore, which is a great feature for us. Um, so it's possible, um, but it's really a, a kind of a product question, right? Engineering wise, we can do it. Product wise, is this something where the benefits of introducing this extra layer actually win us enough to make it worth doing and spending that effort on? Um, I hope so, yes. Um, you can look it on my laptop later, but I'll, once I get approval um, from my manager in the front row, I'll put it on GitHub. <laughs> is the plug, uh, pluggability is, um, enforced or implemented through the plugins and the CLI plugins mostly? Um, so it, this, this is how, how is the pluggability implemented? Um, so the way it works is that Garden uh, has two components. It has a server which provides the API and the rich clients. Um, and you can actually put in just as in, there's an interface to provide a back end. And we have a Garden Linux one, a Garden Windows one. This is a Garden Docker one. It's actually quite easy to plug that in. It's quite a small interface to run the containers that we have. Yeah, the, uh, so, so, so not, not, I mean, it turns out not that many because Garden's quite a small API, so actually Garden is more a subset than the other way around. So we try and limit that abstraction, right? We don't want to have lots and lots of features. Um, but what is more different 
um, is some of the things, some of the trade-offs that are more about running a pad, right? So, for example, when containers, when we have to upgrade God Linux, the containers can keep running, right? We don't have a long-running daemon. Um, we could just reattach the containers. Whereas with Docker, you end up with a long-running daemon process. Um, I don't think there are plans to move away from that yet. So, yeah, good, because that, that makes a lot of sense for that use case. But for a PaaS use case, it's really important to be able to like keep your containers running even when you're doing rolling deploys, which you do a lot. So I, 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 think, I think that's the end of my time. Um, but if you'd like to hear more about this topic, um, there's a panel, Build Packs and Containers for Cloud Foundry, where I suspect the merits of some of these approaches may come up. Um, so it'll be awesome to see you there. Thank you and have a great lunch. <laughs>